Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we step into the past of centuries ago as we trace the journey of Mr. Donald Rathlow and his mother from Toronto, Canada into the jungles of southern Mexico. Their objective? To find the descendants of a once great civilization. For the next 30 minutes, we search for and find the vanishing Mayans. <laughs> Your television pass. And now, here to begin tonight's true story adventure is Jack Douglas. Many centuries ago, even before the Aztecs, there lived a race of people who created a mighty civilization in Central America, whose engineers raised buildings rivaling the pyramids of Egypt, whose astronomers perfected a scientific calendar, whose art we treasure even today. These were the Mayans, who once were believed to have perished with their civilization. But as we know, the Mayans did not disappear from the face of the earth. A small handful of their descendants are still living in virtually primitive state in the jungles of the Mexican-Guatemalan border. And here to give us a new look at the last of this ancient race is Mr. Donald Rathlow of Toronto, Canada. Hi, Mr. Rathlow. Welcome to our program series. Thank you very much, Jack. I'm very happy to be here. Well, now you've come a long way to be on our program. Uh, are you on vacation, or what kind of a job do you have that permits you to get off whenever you please? I work for a newspaper, and I am on vacation at the moment, uh, Jack, but uh, as you can imagine, these trips that I take uh, last much longer than a normal vacation, and the newspaper for which I work is, has been very good in letting me have time off when I needed it. Which newspaper would that be? I work for the Toronto Daily Star. I see, a fine paper indeed. Now, what was the reason for this particular expedition to find the uh, Mayans? Was the objective purely academic, or were you on a story for your paper, or just what? Uh, no, I wasn't after a story for my paper, although, of course, I did give them one when I got back. But ever since I was about 10 years old, I've always wanted to explore the jungles and uh, make friends with the wild animals, visit remote Indian tribes, and since the Lacandon seemed to be the uh, most remote and most primitive group of people left in North America, well, we made that one of our first projects. Well, now, there again, you've mentioned the word Lacandon, and we've heard that in connection with these people. I'd assume they're one and the same, the Mayans and the Lacandons. Yes, the Lacandon and the Maya are one and the same. The, the Lacandons are direct descendants of the Mayas. Yes. Well, there's certainly quite a gap between the jungles of the vanishing Mayans and Toronto, so where do we begin our journey to close the gap? Well, I think we should start with one of the uh, ancient ruined cities so we can see how the Mayas lived in their days of splendor. This is Palenque, one of the great ruined cities of the Mayas in the northern part of Chiapas, just about 75 miles from where we discovered the Lacandon Indians. Now, I'd like you to take a good look at this face that's carved here in the wall at the top there. When we meet the Lacandons later, you'll notice the striking resemblance they have to that carving. You'll see carvings like this on most all Mayan ruins. The Mayans were great builders, they were great astronomers. In fact, Palenque was considered the culmination of their civilization. They are believed to have abandoned Palenque in about the 10th century, and it's really remarkable how their pyramids and temples have withstood the ravages of time and weather all these centuries. They were completely covered with jungle when the city was discovered in the 18th century, just like you see here as we fly on our way to San Cristobal, where we made our headquarters and met Professor Franz Blom and his wife. Professor Blom is quite a distinguished archaeologist, and Mrs. Blom is well known for her writings and studies of the Lacandons. In fact, she went with us to the jungle. They're lovely Afghan dogs on hand to greet us too. Mom and I are on the left. And uh, interesting enough, although we were to go into wild jungle, it was here in civilization that we were viciously attacked by wild animals. <laughs> the expressions on your face. <laughs> My mother was bitten by the dog too. Professor Blom is now going over the map of the area we're about to enter. He himself has explored the jungle extensively. In fact, this is a map that he made for the Mexican government. We knew we were shortly to get into very wet and muddy country. So Mom is here getting the boots oiled well ahead of time. 
We bought everything we needed in the way of food and presents for the Lackendons in San Cristobal. Then by truck, we went to Comitán. And from Comitán, we headed to the little town of Las Margaritas. That's our road on the left. Although it was an extremely rough road, the scenery was one of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen in my life. The town itself was quite pretty, but unfortunately there was no running water and no electric light, no accommodation. In fact, we were quite glad to get out of it. Here we changed from truck to mules. From Las Margaritas, we went by mule back. We had nine pack mules and six riding animals. And poor mom, I'm afraid she had never, well, for all practical purposes, never been on a horse before. And now she was going to go from six to seven hours a day over some of the most rugged trails imaginable. The first day or two, while we were still in the low country, it was reasonably easy going. But gradually we headed into the mountains. In fact, we had to cross several mountain ranges before we reached our destination. We came across a number of these picturesque covered bridges, probably made by natives of this area. It was nine days altogether before we got to the Lackendons. Did the professor and his wife go along with you? No, just Mrs. Blom went with I us. See. The poor mules, I'm afraid, had to carry pretty heavy loads, about 150 or 160 pounds. And when we got to camp at night, they were simply delighted to have the loads off their back. The first thing they'd do would be to roll in the grass. I guess they kind of itched a bit. My mother's mule was even too lazy to roll. All <laughs> she could do was give us a good yawn. We're pretty high up now. We're about six or 7,000 feet up above sea level, so we have very beautiful pine forests. However, gradually, we came down into the more virgin tropical growth. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see some movement there. That's a spider monkey. We saw lots of these monkeys on the way. They were always on hand to give us a good scolding. Now, you've heard about the perils of the jungle, but it's not really that bad, although I am caught in this muddy swamp here while I'm trying to locate wildlife. <laughs> My only success on this particular day, I'm afraid, was just a little turtle that Mom found in the nearby creek. Now, you'll notice when she puts it in the water that hundreds of little fish will go after it. Well, that's only because we put a little meat on its nose to eat, but it didn't eat it. And now the fish are swarming around to see if they can get that little bit of meat. I want you to meet Harry Little, the Robinson Crusoe of the Chiapas jungles. He's one of the most interesting individuals I've ever met. He lives several months of the dry season every year in the jungle, and he was our only neighbor for two months, except for the Lackendons, and he was certainly a very good neighbor, too. He's from the United States, Vermont. He went with us to the Lackendons because he knew exactly where they were. This is typical of the camps that we set up in the jungle. After first putting up the tents to protect the food and a place for the men to sleep, they immediately went ahead and made benches and tables out of poles. Everything is tied together with bahuka vines. They don't use any nails. You're working very hard, aren't you? <laughs> I let them do the work. <laughs> I had to try everything on the menu, but I think I liked our own food better, such as this ham that Mom's smoking over the fire. Imagine having Mother's home cooking right on the trail. Here's one of her specialties. These are donuts that she made. And although she claimed she didn't have half the ingredients necessary, I thought they were just about the best things I'd ever eaten all my life. Maybe that's because I just had such a terrific appetite while I was in the jungle. And I could easily get a big appetite because sometimes I would make trips into the jungle myself and I always had to carry a lot of equipment. And it was necessary to be careful because these thorny trees were everywhere and they're covered with insects such as these ants which could really give a nasty bite at times. Now we're in the land of the Lackendons. Very beautiful land it is. This, Jack, is our first view of the Lackendons, the vanishing Mayas. It was just like being taken back into the Stone Age. Now these three people that are coming across in a cayuco or dugout canoe, 
Regardless of appearances are men. It's very difficult to tell the men from the women because they wear the same clothes, they have the same long hair, and that same smooth, hairless skin. We had quite a tragedy here, unfortunately. A man, Jose Mendez, whom we sent ahead to tell the Lacandos of our coming, drowned in this river while trying to cross it. And Bohr, very dramatically, is explaining how it happened. Bohr is the chief of the tribe. Now, wait a minute. The messenger you sent on ahead drowned here in this river? Unfortunately, that's true. And as soon as we heard about that, we sent word back to the jungle village from where he came, and some members of his family came and had a funeral service for him. They put up this little cross, lit some candles in front of it, and set off some rockets. And that was all there was to it, and they went back home. The man worked for Harry Little, whom you see here now in regular jungle attire, and he was quite broken up about the thing. Boar is in a little more cheerful mood now. Mrs. Blom has brought him some tobacco leaves, and he's rolled them up and made a cigar. The Lagandons were very helpful. They pitched right in to give us a hand with our equipment. One of the big troubles we had was getting the mules across. Although we had a lead horse to guide them across, they nevertheless got into trouble. When they got to the other side, the bank was so steep that they couldn't climb up. And Mrs. Blom was simply frantic. She thought that they were going to go back into the water and perhaps drown. So she took off her trousers and went in with her underwear to try and get the mules back onto the shore. At one point, I jumped in to give a hand, and I'm afraid I got thoroughly stuck in the mud. I jumped into the wrong spot. However, we did eventually get the mules up onto the shore without any mishap. Thank you very much, Mr. Rathlow. Part two of tonight's True Story Adventure continues in just a moment. It took, I guess, about an hour in all to get all our equipment and the mules across the river. The men are now going back for the final load. And as you can guess, this was a hard work for them, and they got pretty hot, and the first thing they did was whip off their robe and dive into the water. They didn't think anything of it. Didn't matter who was present. They're just like big children, really. Bor, the chief, is now leading us to his house in the jungle. There's no walls on three sides. The complete tribe, only ten, all live in this shelter. They just sleep in the hammocks. In fact, they work in the hammocks if they can get away with it. They're not too energetic. One of the first things we did was give them presents. These are bright red handkerchiefs that Mom is giving them. The Lacandons wear these red handkerchiefs around their neck. In fact, red is the sacred color of the Lacandons. And it's the only way you can tell the men from the women. The men wear the handkerchiefs around the neck, and the women wear beads around the neck. That's Kayum, Boar's little son, and he's getting a little rubber dog from Mom, and he seems to be quite delighted with it. <laughs> This couple here are a brother and sister, husband and wife team. You see, there are only ten Lacandons left in this group, and they're forced into this situation of marrying brothers and sisters. In fact, there's only about 150 or 160 Lacandons left altogether, and they live in isolated groups. Lacandon volleyball. That's Keen, Boar's second son, playing with a balloon with Mom. We brought the balloon, of course. Keen was the interpreter for the group. He was the only one who could speak Spanish in a half-intelligible manner. I would assume, Mr. Rathlow, that none of these people spoke any English at all. Absolutely none. Absolutely none. Keen is trying to sharpen a hunting knife we gave him, and I might say they're very good judges of steel. Now, this is something you might think we gave them, but it isn't. This lad carved this himself, and he used as a model an airplane that had crashed in the nearby savanna. I think it's a very excellent job. This is little Margarita, the 10-year-old wife of Chief Boar. Now, we understand that she's only his wife in name until she comes of age, but she acted like a true wife to him in every way, showing him much affection and making his tortillas as she's doing here. Did he have other wives, Mr. No, Rambo? no. Polygamy is allowed, but in this particular group, they're too small. They didn't have any more women. Margarita's spinning cotton here. Boar's determined that they shouldn't forget how to be self-sufficient in the jungle. Although at the moment they're relying too much on handouts from expeditions. 
Margarita, although she's a wife, here she is playing with some dolls that were carved for her by her now deceased mother. She made that little dress for the doll herself. The safety pin was given to her by Mrs. Blom. This doll she got from my mother, and she was so proud of it, she made a little hammock for it, just for the doll alone. Bohr loved his little wife and looked after her very well, cleaned her hair and braided it like he's doing here. There was much affection between them. One of the first jobs that Mrs. Blom did was to give little Cayuma a haircut. I'm afraid he looked more like a sheepdog than anything else when we first arrived. He took it all very well. In fact, he thought it was all quite a joke. <laughs> the cut hair itched him, so he shakes it out. We soon became very friendly with these people. They've never been conquered by white men. They've never been under the thumb of white men, so they don't have that same suspicion and fear that some of the other Indians do have. The Lacandons wanted to show us their milpa, their cornfield. So they're taking us up river now, and while they had to pull the Cayuco in the shallow spots where there were rapids, we had to walk on shore. A Lacandon milpa is really something to see. Although this was harvest time, we couldn't see a single corn stalk. It was completely covered with jungle. And the Lacandons had to take a machete and cut away the jungle before they could get to the corn. And when they did get to it, it looked to be very good corn, in spite of all the jungle. Well, now, didn't they tend to the corn while it was growing? Well, normally they will. But at the moment, they were making a new milpa upstream, and they get plenty of rain, and they don't have to irrigate corn at all. Corn, of course, is the basic food of the Lacandons, as it is pretty well of all Indians in Mexico. They make their tortillas, they make drinks out of it, pozole, atole, they even pop it like we do in the coals of their fire. And this instrument that Nakin is using to crush the corn is one that they've been using for centuries. It's the same sort of instrument that you will see in the museums. It's called a metate. And after the corn is crushed, it's mixed with water for making pozole. That's all it is, just water and crushed corn, no flavoring or anything. But it's a very important drink with these people, an important food. There's another drink. What she's making there in that big clay pot is a tole. Margarita was always being a little mischievous. <laughs> Whatever wild meat the Lacandons can hunt, of course, they add to their diet. Armadillo is one of their commonest foods. Here, Bohr is lighting his cigar with a firebrand, and fire is no problem to these people. They can make it by taking a piece of flint, a piece of iron, and then they make a spark and ignite a piece of wild cotton. Now, they didn't have to do this much because we brought them plenty of matches probably last them quite a long time. This group of Lacandons is the only one that still does not have guns of any kind. They still hunt strictly with the use of dogs or with bows and arrows. And here they are making arrow shafts. To make the arrow heads, they would take a piece of flint, which they would find in the river beds, and then they'd take another rock and pound the flint, sort of breaking it up partly, then they'd take a hard piece of deer antler, hold it against the flint, and then with another rock, bang the antler, and so break off the chips of flint which they used for the arrowheads. Now, I'd like to point out, Jack, that these people were extremely honest, and their children were very well brought up. I didn't have the slightest hesitation in leaving my camera equipment right in the middle of their house and going off for hours, absolutely sure that nothing would be touched. It just seems foreign to their nature to touch what belongs to others. Or here's trimming some feathers for the arrow shafts. We asked Chan Bor to try the arrow out. We told him not to actually shoot it, but he did, and we all had to duck for cover because one of those arrows could do quite a bit of damage if it hit anyone. The Lacandons then gave me some arrows and wanted me to try my hand at it. I'm afraid I didn't have quite the strength of the Lacandons, and I couldn't pull that bow back very far. 
Keene here is showing me how to do it, but I think he considers the whole thing just a big joke. It was raining nearly all the time that we were with the Lackandons, so much so that they were unable to work on their new milpa. So now we're going to see a ceremony to their gods in which they're going to petition the gods to bring the rains to a halt. They make a little altar, then they burn incense under this altar, and then they take pasoli, and with a little wooden stick, they flick it to the four winds, and after they've done this, they take a large jungle leaf, make a horn, and blow to the four winds, calling on the gods to partake of the pasoli. And they're chanting all the time. Now, they must have some deal with the gods, because when the ceremony is all over, the Lacandons themselves drink up the pasoli. In fact, it seems to be quite a festive occasion. When this is over, they take a leaf and hold it over the burning incense so that the leaf gets the sacred smoke on it, and chanting all the while, they call on the gods to bless their wives and children. They'll need help. This is the whole group, just ten of them left, and it's really hard to see how they could possibly survive without some outside help. I think we can truly call them the vanishing Mayans. Thank you very much, Mr. Rathlow. Well, now, what can be done, what is being done, Mr. Rathlow, if you know, by the Mexican authorities to try to save these people from extinction? Well, as far as I know, Jack, nothing is being done at the moment. However, I have heard that the Mexican gov government is planning to take action to try and help these people. Of course, individuals like uh, Mr. and Mrs. Blom are doing what they can in a small way to help these people. But it would seem if they're really to be helped, it would need some rather uh, extensive action by the Mexican government. For what was once a very, very mighty race. Now, of these many gifts that we saw you bring to the Lacandon people, the last of the Mayans, which would you say uh, they appreciated or enjoyed the most? Oh, that's very hard to say. We brought them a lot of things that were very useful, such as machetes and uh, cloth to make their clothing. Another thing we brought them was soap. And uh, yet all the time that we were, were with them, we never saw them use it once. Really? And it seemed to be the reason they liked it so much was because of the little colorful red wrappings that it had. <laughs> well, I know that uh, they must have appreciated the more useful items like the machetes, because certainly living in a jungle uh, climate, a jungle terrain, those things would come in handiest of all. Well, your mother certainly made a most agreeable partner. Was this her first journey into the jungle country? No, Jack, it wasn't her first. Uh, we made a journey into the jungle, uh, the jungles of Campeche, which is a neighboring state to Chiapas, where you've just seen the films, uh, about three years ago, and my mother was with me at that time. Uh, as for being an agreeable partner, well, she was much, much more than that. She was certainly a great help. And uh, I can tell you it was certainly enjoyable to have uh, mother's home cooking right there in the jungle. I should say this is probably the first expedition of its kind that can make that boast. Well, now, during the film, Mr. Rathlow, you referred to this Mr. Harry Little as the uh, Robinson Crusoe of the Chiapas jungle. How'd he come by that moniker? Oh, well, that's just a moniker I gave him. Uh, the way he lived in the jungle there with his long beard, well, it just seemed to suit him. I see. Well, this has been a very uh, fine adventure story you've brought us, a very enjoyable one. We've enjoyed it a great deal, and I hope that you'll uh, thank your mother as well. We're sorry she wasn't able to come to see us from Toronto, and I hope you'll thank our friends in Toronto, Canada. Thank you, Mr. Donald Rathlow. We enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much. Our pleasure, sir. We'll have another unusual true story adventure at the same time next week, ladies and gentlemen, and highlights from that episode in just a few moments. Next week, we journey with Colonel Nichols Smith to search for and find a paradise on Earth, the land of Shangri-La in Tibet. The caravan takes us high into the Himalayas for a unique visit with the King and Queen of Ladakh, who give Colonel Smith a pair of rare Lhasa Terriers. The search is fulfilled when Colonel Smith discovers the hidden valley of Hemus, and there the four-year-old child Lama, the reincarnated ruler of Western Tibet. That's next week. The Search for Shangri-La.
Before we say good night, I'd like to mention again, as we have from time to time, that you're as welcome as anyone else to be a guest on our True Adventure program if you have a 16 millimeter film of an adventure journey somewhere in the world. Please write to me, care of this station, giving full details, and your letter will receive prompt and personal attention. My thanks once again to Mr. Donald Rathlow, as always to you, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Thank you so much, and good night.